It is a treat to be here. Um, I would like to open up with an land acknowledgement first of where I'm speaking to you from. I'm in Northern California, ancestral home to the Pomo and Miwok people. And they are still here despite state and federal policy sanctioned genocide um, supported by the US government. And over the course of 30 years in the mid to late 19th century, the California Native American population plunged from about 150,000 people to 30,000 people. And despite these targeted extermination efforts and forced enslavement of California's indigenous people, the Pomo and Miwok people are resilient and still here. Excuse me. So, Hestquex, um, good morning. I'm in California where it is about 10 in the morning and thank you for joining me today. I'm gonna to share with you how storytelling as science can be used to understand maternal infant health. I'm Janelle Palacios, I'm Salish and Kootenai. I grew up all over the Flathead Indian Reservation in Northwestern Montana. Uh, my family connections back home include the Claremonts, the Berlins, the Dupuis and the Sweeney's. After completing nursing school, I moved to San Francisco and began graduate school, earning my PhD and a master's degree, becoming both a researcher and a midwife. Today, I live in the Bay Area and I work as a midwife te teaching OBGYN residents and as a researcher, looking at labor problems in the hospital, but also service delivery among rural populations. So this presentation I'm gonna share with you is a culmination of 40 years of lived experience, cultural and familial teachings and academic education. As a witness of traumas experienced by my family um, and friends and community, and also someone with personal experience of trauma, I wanted to understand why. The answers back home were just too close to see. I was living in it. It was hard for me to see what was going on. And it took distance from my land and community to see how our collective native history contributed to our own responses to cope that came in the form of violence, abuse, neglect, other behaviors. This presentation has grown to demonstrate how a story about history is key to understanding maternal child health outcomes among Native people. In this presentation, I cover just a few key historical points and largely keep the brunt of the focus on the lower 48 um, states. But I want you to know that both the Indigenous people of Alaska and Hawaii have special histories since colonization, and I invite you to learn more about them. I want to warn you that this presentation can be triggering and intentionally is meant to shine a light where often darkness has covered our truths. I will discuss intergenerational loss, forced boarding school attendance, targeted sterilizations, and how violence, neglect, and abuse were actively carried out upon our people, both in the past and continue today. While this presentation tends to weave way heavily on the adverse side of our history and experience, you must know we have tremendous strength and resilience after a targeted genocide, extermination, and assimilation policies, because we are still here today. Today, with their permission, I will weave my family's story into our general Native history and talk about my family's health outcomes in context of our larger history. So before you, you see my great-grandmother, Olive Dupuy, and my great-grandfather, Ernest Claremont. Both grew up in a heavily Catholic community. My grandmother attended the local Indian boarding school run by the Ursuline nuns, and my grandfather attended Haskell Indian Boarding School. So here are four key learning objectives. I'm gonna talk a little bit about history, weaving that with um, indigenous knowledge. I'm gonna review just some um, his key historical events about um, Native American history and contemporary issues we face. And then I'm gonna share how experience the story can situate context and improve our understanding. So these slides are seen everywhere. We talk about health disparities and they were mentioned briefly during yesterday's presentation where black and indigenous women die somewhere between two to five times the rate of white women, depending on what you're looking at. Education is not protective for black women or indigenous women. And um, as their maternal mortality uh, morbidity increases with age. So as, as black and indigenous women age, we die more frequently. We have more worse outcomes than white women do. So black and indigenous infants also die at higher rates related to sudden unexpected infant death syndrome. And depending upon your reference year, we switch places between um, the black and indigenous inf infants. They swap places for first place of who dies the most. These two maps 
uh, illustrate sudden unexpected infant deaths um, rates visually where the hotspots are noted in darker blue. We see which states have the highest um, rates of sudden unexpected infant deaths. And again, depending on your reference year, the map shifts a little bit in color. So these are the few key theories that I'm gonna talk about and it's gonna be just very broadly and um, skimming over a lot of details. So this slide explains life course theory. So in general, if we think about someone's life from birth to death, over their lifetime, they encounter assaults or risk factors, and they also encounter protective factors. So for example, white women may experience less assaults over their lifetime, have greater support systems, and therefore have better health outcomes, such as fewer preterm deliveries and a lower risk for dying while pregnant. Black and certainly indigenous women are at risk of experiencing more assaults over their life course with fewer protective factors to mitigate the assaults overall affecting reproductive and perinatal health, resulting in higher rates of preterm deliveries and a high rate of maternal deaths. So if this slide explains how assaults upon one's life from birth to death affect their health outcomes, then weathering explains what exactly those assaults are and how these assaults can affect the body on a molecular level. When we have repeated exposure to socioeconomic adversity, political marginalization, racism, and perpetual discrimination that harms health, weathering takes place. Weathering kills in slow, less obvious ways. Weathering has been studied among Black and Latina women, but I believe it has relevance for Native women too. How can weathering and assaults over time be measured? So one way is to look at adverse childhood experiences. Oh, I'm just going to take a pause. I'm making sure that um, the people who are in the waiting room are being admitted. If I see a, a nod on the head, perfect. We also know that the presence of traumatic childhood experiences, such as abuse, neglect, and witnessing experiences like crime, parental conflict, mental illness, and substance use, can result in long-term negative um, health effects and behaviors. So additionally, these traumatic events create dangerous levels of stress that can affect healthy brain development and in turn affect how the body responds to stress. Adults with adverse childhood experiences have an increased risk of smoking, alcoholism, depression, heart disease, suicide attempts, and diabetes, as well as of another of a number of other agents. And as was shared yesterday, it is common to find high ACE scores throughout Indian country. This is just a brief slide to share, show with you how I wanted to incorporate the historical piece. The previous three theoretical frameworks, life course that included weathering and adverse childhood experiences, when they first appeared, they only really thought of the, the person from birth to death. We didn't have anything backgrounding that person when they were born into life, what backgrounded them. And that's really important. That's a key missing portion from a lot of Western thought. These important frameworks left out history. I incorporated historical trauma theory as conceptualized by Dr. Maria Yellowhorse um, Braveheart with weathering to help explain the state of Native women's health. So as the first few generations of Native peoples experienced traumatic events, responses were passed on to future generations, both on a molecular level, but also through behaviors. Today, we now understand that trauma can leave a chemical mark on a person's gene, which can be passed down to future generations. This mark doesn't necessarily cause a genetic mutation, but it does alter the mechanism by which the gene is expressed. This alteration is not genetic, but epigenetic. My work was trying to understand Native women's health in context of our history, of traumatic events, and also daily living and opportunities available. So I really like this visual from Vanderbilt. It shows social determinants of health as roots and tree leaves as health outcomes. So social determinants of health are the conditions in which people are born into. They grow and live and work and age. And it's really shaped by distribution of money, power, and resources. So differences in these conditions lead to health inequities or the unfair and avoidable differences in health status. And why are these social determinants of health important? Because they're key drivers of health inequities, especially among people of color. If the leaves are the health outcomes as a result of social determinants of health, roots, then I would like to go a step further and say that the soil backgrounding and nurturing the roots includes our history and subsequent policies that have shaped social determinants of health. So now for the difficult part of this um, presentation. 
So this slide shows what healthcare professionals might see when they review cases of death or near misses. And this is what these cases look like when you see the people behind them. These are four women I know very familiar. My grandmother, my great aunt, my mother, and myself. I'm standing in for my childhood friend, Tashina. Three of these women were teen mothers. Combined, these women survived nine preterm deliveries, two infant deaths, a coerced sterilization, suicidal ideation, alcoholism, abusive violent relationships, multiple near misses and being murdered, poverty and daily encounters steeped in racism. To receive better care, if you had money, a tank of gas and reliable transportation, the choice to buy goods and services off reservation was always prioritized. One of these women chose to drove over 120 miles round trip to deliver her first child for fear of what she would encounter at the local hospital. So this presentation will discuss each of these women's experiences of maternal infant morbidity and mortality in terms of their life contexts, not their race, but their inherited histories, their launch in life, and the opportunities open to them in the life they lived. These stories will help frame our understanding of how powerful the background story really is. So I'm gonna start with history, a marginalized history, and one that is not often recognized or discussed. These are key historical events I will share with you that give rise to current health conditions. Before contact in 1492, the estimated conservative size of the indigenous population at the time for both Northern and Southern continent was roughly 60 million people. In Europe, it was roughly 70 to 80 million. By 1600, the indigenous population lost 56 million people, largely due to diseases brought across the Atlantic, such as smallpox, measles, influenza, and the plague. 90% of the indigenous population was lost within 110 years, which roughly equates to 10% of the global population, making it the largest human mortality event by proportion. For comparison, 80 million people died in World War II, accounting for 3% of the global population and roughly 65% of the Jewish population was lost. As westward expansion continued and treaty making was happening, the indigenous people were removed from their homelands and pushed farther west, corralled onto smaller and smaller territories. This slide shows the largest organized force removal by the US government in 1830 called the Indian Removal Act, which was supported by President Andrew Jackson and passed by Congress. Over 100,000 men, women, and children and infants were given a martial escort, traversing over 5,000 miles at times across land and water to the Oklahoma Territory and forced onto reservations. This death march, would later be named the Trail of Tears, and it is estimated that four to 8,000 men, women, and children died of cold, hunger, and disease during this winter death march. Prior to 1871, the U.S. government had treaties with different tribes, and it is precisely for this reason that a number of tribes today have been able to maintain a special status with the federal government. In exchange for ceding land, giving up our land for smaller plots of land, the federal government gave smaller plots of land called reservations to people in, the, in addition to access to healthcare and education to tribes. Again, because my ancestors ceded our ancestral land and agreed to give up large portions of our traditional lands, my ancestors were relegated to reservations, imprisoned there oftentimes for one generation or more, and given meager resources. The alternative was to fight and die, and some tribes did do this, and they forfeited their federal recognition. Of note, it's really important that um, during this time of the reservation formation, many Native people were not allowed off reservation. They were actually shot and killed um, if they left the reservation. And this is important to know because of food resources. As food resources were dwindling on a smaller plots of land on the reservation and people were leaving to go hunt and fish or collect um, uh, forage in the forest, uh, they were shot and killed because they were starving and they were left on these smaller plots of land. So on this slide, you see the traditional lands of the Sioux, also known as the Nakoda, Dakota, and Lakota. Originally in green, you can see their traditional lands across the Midwest, and currently the reservations are much smaller in a few states, predominantly in North Dakota, South Dakota, Minnesota, and Nebraska. For anyone who knows about Black Hills Gold, this was a major reason why the Sioux were relocated off their traditional reservation lands. This map also shows Pine Ridge Reservation, famous for the massacre of Wounded Knee in 1890, and again in 1973 during the American Indian Movement occupation. To the north, indicated by the red star, we see Standing Rock, 
ground zero for the Dakota Access Pipeline, which has already leaked five times. So this slide shows um, the land ceded or forcibly taken from the indigenous people by date. So in a span of 60 years, 1830 to 1890, most of the land had been taken. And this is our current map of today, purple highlighting federally recognized tribes with reservations. The tiny green speckles are lands that are Indian reservations that are state only recognized. They do not have nation to nation status with the federal government. And today there are 574 federally recognized tribes in the US. So next, let's talk about food sources. Bison were a traditional major food source for many native people. And as you can see, there were two types of bison, the plains bison and the woodland bison, which is now extinct. In a span of 70 years from 1830 to 1900, the bison in North America dropped from 40 million to 300. Today's bison are descendants of the original leftover 300. Bison were directly targeted for sport, food, and to sell their hides. But the dramatic shift in bison population is largely attributed to the government policies aimed at eliminating this food source to weaken any uprisings, preventing tribes from unifying and living together in large numbers. The sharp decline in available food source also created widespread starvation, and the government was able to more easily move tribes onto reservations when they controlled food sources. So this painting is named American Progress. Aptly named as this allegory perfectly represents the Western view of progress. Lady Progress is seen moving from the enlightened and civilized East towards the dark stormy wild West, chasing Indians and Buffalo to make way for American progress, marked by farming, cities, industry, and train systems. To facilitate assimilation, the government enacted the Dawes Act of 1887. So this gave heads of households individual parcels of land to farm, but also allowed tribes for the first time to outright sell land from their reservation to non-Indians. This shift in property ownership and ability to sell reservation land had disastrous results and was later reversed. So in general, the Dawes Act promoted the concept of westward expansion by promising land in return for settlement. It was an attempt to handle increasing conflicts and to separate Native people from tribal lands while trying to force cultural conformity, accepting a Western model of land ownership. While some tribes historically farmed, many did not, and the concept that an individual could own a piece of land was still foreign. Additionally, the Dawes Act allowed the government to sell and give away land to settlers. This is an actual ad posted in 1911 by the U.S. Department of the Interior, advertising reservation Indian land. And this is in fact how my father's family made their way from Germany through the Dakotas to Montana to buy surplus reservation land. This slide represents the after effect of the Dawes Act. This is a map of my reservation in Montana. Today, the reservation is a patchwork quilt of land actually held by my tribe versus non-tribal settlers. The green is tribally trust held land as, and is largely forested or prairie land and is managed by the tribal government. Orange color are plots of land held in individual trusts, so tribal members own those land. The light yellow land is called fee land, or land that is no longer held in trust, therefore no longer tribal land, and is land largely held by non-native people. On my reservation, this is, and largely, this is land largely in towns and around our lake and farming land. This is where I usually ask, you know, what year was religious freedom founded in this country? And some might answer 1620 with the Mayflower. Others might say 1791 with the First Amendment. I learned both answers growing up in school. They were each on my quizzes and tests. However, it took me to going to college where I learned that Native people received the right to religious freedom in 1978, only 43 years ago, where Native people finally, they were allowed to legally engage in their religious beliefs. Similarly, Native people were granted citizenship in the United States in 1924 but did not receive nationwide right to vote until the late, until the mid 1960s, because each state was allowed to decide when native people could vote. In returning to religious freedom, I wanna point out the image on the right, which is of a ghost dance, a religious ritual believed to drive away invading settlers and restore the indigenous people to their ancestral lands and way of life. This dance was banned as the government believed it would renew native militancy and lead to violent rebellions. On December 29, 1890, in one of the final chapters of America's long Indian Wars, 
the U.S. Cavalry, Cavalry killed 146 Sioux at Wounded Knee on the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota in response to stopping the ghost dances. Historians speculate that double the number of Sioux people were killed and half speculated to be women and children, but that bodies were taken by family members for burial. The U.S. 7th Cavalry lost 25 men that day. This photo shows the mass grave following the massacre at Wounded Knee. This painting done by Oscar Howe, a Dakota man, had a personal connection to the massacre, recalling his own grandmother's stories of being shot in the hand by U.S. Cavalry. This painting was purchased as a gift for President Dwight D. Eisenhower. So next I'll talk about boarding school experiences. And I want you to know that the ramifications of boarding school experience continues today. We have survivors of boarding school experiences that are still dealing with the trauma today. Not long after reservations were formed in, and the indigenous people forced onto them, boarding schools were created. Oftentimes they were religious-based boarding schools that were federally funded to educate children. But the most, um, the oldest Indian boarding school and the one that many are modeled after was the 1879 Carlisle Indian Boarding School located in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. General Richard Henry Pratt, a Civil War veteran, founded this boarding school and modeled it after the military system and was widely known for his public brand, Kill the Indian, Save the Man. General Pratt believed the Indian savage was equal to Europeans, but it was necessary to kill the savage, strip him of his language, culture, and family, and reinforce this with corporal punishment in order to encourage these children to rely upon themselves and not their collective community and family as they had been taught. Students were forced to cut their hair, change their names, stop speaking their native languages, convert to Christianity, and endure harsh disciplines, including corporal punishment and solitary confinement for any infraction of these rules. This approach was ultimately used by hundreds of other Native American boarding schools, some operated by the government, and many more operated by churches. Carlisle was the model Indian boarding school for its time, the federally funded template, of which 26 more were modeled and spanned across the country. Over 10,000 Indian kids were held hostage here, representing over 140 unique tribes with their own cultures and languages. It was customary for children to be sent far away to deter them from escaping. The early boarding schools were, relocated, were located remotely from um, tribal nations. Children were stolen from their families as young as age four and imprisoned at these institutions until they turned 18 or 19. In the summer months, children either stayed at the boarding school or were often hired out to surrounding families in an ongoing effort to detribalize the youth. These two photos are of Arapaho children. The photo on the left was taken upon entry to the boarding school and the photo on the right taken as they began their assimilation. This photo taken in 1880, oftentimes General Pratt had before and after photos taken to document successful assimilation. The whole point was to assimilate native youth, the next generation, to enforce a Western standard of ideology for beauty, intelligence, accomplishment, success, values, beliefs, and practices. We see here Tom Tolino, a young Diné teen who was captured and taken to Carlisle in 1882 with other Diné kids. This side-by-side -side comparison of Tom is of his first day in 1882 and three years later in 1885. Publicity, propaganda, these photos documented the successful assimilation. This is a photo of my great-grandfather, Ernest. He attended Haskell Indian Boarding School until he enlisted in World War I. Today, excuse me, as time went on, children um, would run away from boarding schools and it proved expensive and challenging. So Indian boarding schools were built on reservations. And while these are not photos from my reservation, the Ursuline nuns operated the St. Ignatius Mission Boarding School on the Flathead Indian Reservation which was founded in 1864 and closed in the 1970s. In 2011, 45 men and women stepped forward with allegations of sexual, physical, and emotional abuse as children attending the Catholic boarding school ran by the Ursuline nuns and Jesuit priests, with some victims as young as age five. Before it finally closed, at least three attempts had been made to burn the facility down. All fires thought to be started by students. Though we have one story that I heard growing up, where children were, who children who are now adults remember being forced into a room by a nun and locked inside while the school was burning. They were only saved by a nearby farmer who had rescued them um, from the locked room after seeing the fire from his property. 
again, this isn't within living memory today and people are still dealing with these traumas. Today, the U.S. Bureau of, of Indian Education still directly operates four off-reservation boarding schools in Oklahoma, California, Oregon, and South Dakota. These schools aim to provide a quality education to students from across Indian country and to empower indigenous youth. The top link is to the Carlisle Indian um, Boarding School Digital Resource Center, where most of my photos have been found. And the bottom link is to read more stories from Carlisle Indian Boarding School from the survivors and their family members. So as young as age four, look at the children in the front row trapped for 15 years. The boarding school is not just a way to assimilate future generations. It was also a way to terrorize them and disrupt healthy family patterns. Children grew up without their parents and extended family, without healthy role models for what a functioning family looks like. And survivors of the boarding school talk about returning to their homes ill-equipped to the skills, language, and culture to function normally and healthily in their community. Over the past 30 years, survivors have come forward sharing their stories of abuse at the hands of adults in charge of them, but also fellow students. Verbal abuse, sexual abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse, violence, violence, and more violence. One hundred and eighty-six children graves are at Carlisle Indian Boarding School. Survivors have shared their collective memories of murder and neglect. Children who tried to escape were hunted and sometimes killed. When reading historical documents, it's astounding as to the number of children who died while out on an outing, and you can read these yourselves. During 2021, mass unmarked graves at a Christian-run boarding school have, were found using sonic technology. And by June 2021, nearly 400 children's bodies had been unearthed by investigating the land surrounding Indian boarding schools throughout Canada and the United States. In Albuquerque, a local park, which was the site of an Indian boarding school, found 120 children's bodies had been buried in a mass grave and was found only when civic projects were underway. As of September 29, 2021, 6,509 children and infants' bodies have been found in marked and unmarked graves across the U.S. and Canada. September 30th is now recognized as the National Day of Remembrance for U.S. Indian boarding schools. This year, on April Fools, Pope Francis issued an apology to the First Nation people of Canada for past abuses children experienced at Indian boarding schools ran by Catholic Church and other Christian sects. However, nearly four years ago to the day, Pope Francis declined meeting with Indigenous representatives in Canada to offer an apology. And while his decision for not responding to Canada's Indigenous peoples and Prime Minister Trudeau's request for an apology, um, from the Vatican for the historical atrocities that affected First Nation people. It finally happened a few days ago. Perhaps mass unmarked graves with children and infants' bodies found on church property prompted a response. Some would argue that as Indian boarding schools fell out of favor, placing Native children in adoption increasingly became the route for continued assimilation and cultural destruction. So remember, Indian identity, identity is complex and it's a heatedly debated issue within tribes and on the state and federal level. One area where Indian identity has life-changing implications is when we look at children being adopted. 2015 data across the US found that Native children are overrepresented than any other ethnic identity within the foster care adoption population. For every one white child, there are about three Native children in foster care. And as the boarding school era fell out of favor, it was estimated that between one quarter to one third of Native children were stolen from their families and tribes. One last method to deal with the Indian problem was to assimilate Natives through a 1950s policy called the Indian Relocation Act. This time, to assimilate Natives, they looked to terminating reservations by encouraging whole families to move to cities. Over 200,000 Natives were displaced or relocated into cities like New York, LA, Denver, Minneapolis, Chicago, Seattle, San Francisco. This too proved disastrous, leaving entire families stranded in cities without promised support and lack of support to return to their communities or completely dissolving their tribe. Today, as a direct result of the Indian Relocation Act, we have an urban Indian population. Seven out of 10 American Indian Alaska Native people live in urban areas. <laughs> 
Finally, in the 1970s, the federal government enacted a policy allowing tribes self-determination, the right to govern and police themselves, the right to decide what type of healthcare provisions their community needed. And this is important for us. This is, this is contexting why we have this conference today. So roughly 9 million people today identify as American Indian, which is almost 3% of the US population. And remember, there are 574 federally recognized tribes, many with their own language and customs and culture. Native Americans are the only ethnic group in the US that still require tedious record keeping to prove identity. To determine who was eligible for land, the federal government required each tribe to recreate requirements to determine tribal membership. Keep in mind that many tribes traditionally had dynamic values regarding identity. French fur trappers and people historically captured during wartime were usually given equal tribal status and membership. It was through actions that determined identity. So the Western idea of linking identity to blood quantum, much as one would view the pedigree of a dog or a horse, it was foreign. And nevertheless, this was strongly supported by the US government, which usually supported at least one quarter degree of Indian blood of a particular tribe's blood to be enrolled. It's no coincidence that a degree of blood quantum was instated among many tribes to identify tribal membership. The long game for the government was that the Indian problem would gradually fade away as the blood thinned and tribal membership dropped. American Indian identity and tribal membership is a sensitive issue today. There are indigenous people who meet a degree of Indian blood percentage, but do not have enough of any one tribe and thus are not enrolled. You also have those people who grow up in their community with their culture, living the same lives, experiencing the same obstacles and hardships, but fall short of blood quantum required for membership. You can imagine this all makes data collection, when actually done, very messy. We are often misclassified by others, especially when we come in a variety of appearances and locations from rural to urban, and much of this is rooted in our history. So rather than asking someone, how much Indian are you? A better question would be, where are your people from or which tribe are you? And again, why is this important? Tribal membership means access to resources such as tribal dividends, tribal program assistance, educational scholarships sometimes, health services, and it can also mean access to land or housing. While this photo shows newly built HUD homes on my reservation, you're not seeing the HUD housing neighborhood I grew up in. Living on some reservations has been likened to living in a developing country. Over 300,000 Native people are underhoused or homeless. More than 30% of reservation housing is overcrowded, while only 50% of the same housing is connected to sanitation. When I was 14, I lived in a house of eight people that only had two bedrooms and one bathroom. One in 10 families have stable and reliable internet connection on reservations. One in 10 families have unreliable sources of clean, fresh water. And one in three reservation-based families live without plumbing. And on any given day, depending on which tribal community you visit, again, we have regional differences, the rate of poverty ranges from 25% to 64%. And for reference, the poverty rate during the Great Depression nationwide was about 25%. During the worst part of the pandemic, August of 2020, the highest poverty rate was 17.3%. Can you imagine living in a poverty rate of 30 to 60% day to day in the US? It happens. It happens on reservations. Another source resource is access to kamads, and this might look familiar. I grew up eating this food as a part of my childhood. My favorite snack was raw spaghetti sticks dipped in peanut butter, and that peanut butter was oily. Another resource for tribally enrolled members is access to health care through Indian Health Service. In the 1950s, the Indian Health Service was created. It was split into 12 service areas. Unfortunately, it was at an IHS service site that a mass sterilization campaign was carried out upon Native women. In 1972, a woman entered a Los Angeles clinic requesting a womb transplant. She relayed a story of having her uterus taken out at an IHS facility. Similarly, two 15-year-old girls went to an IHS clinic and hospital in Montana for appendectomies and were discharged with tubal ligations as well. Neither had been consented nor their parents. After uncovering a number of anecdotal incidents, an investigation was conducted in 1976 by the US General Accountability Office. Now this investigation only reviewed four of the 12 Indian Health Service areas between 1973 through 1976. During that three-year period, of those four IHS centers, they uncovered 3,406 women had been sterilized. 
And of these, 36 cases involved women under age 21, with the youngest being aged 11. Today, it's not clear why the investigation did not include all 12 sites, nor why it only included a span of three years. Experts hypothesized that at least 25% and as much as 40% of the childbearing population at this time had been sterilized. On the higher estimate, roughly 70,000 women had been sterilized over this period. Comparatively, the rate of sterilization for white women during this same period was about 15%. So taking a woman's future reproductive capability without consent is an egregious human rights violation. And when targeting a specific population, it's genocide as defined by the WHO. And while some sterilizations may have been desired, the massive sterilization campaign against this population started in the 1930s, spilling over the 1980s, spanning 50 years at least. Some boarding school survivors have come forward with their own stories of forced sterilization before leaving school. Native American women and girls face a high chance that they will experience violence and or possibly be abducted and or murdered. In 2016 alone, 5,712 indigenous women and girls were reported missing or murdered. 84% of Indigenous women have experienced violence in their life. 56% have experienced sexual violence. And on some reservations, Indigenous women are murdered 10 times the national average. Murder is the third leading cause of death for Indigenous women. 96% of rapes are perpetrated by non-Native men, but non-Native offenders are rarely prosecuted on tribal lands. If Native women and children are targeted as an easy population to disappear for nefarious reasons, then incarceration rates would tell the same story. When we turned on incarceration rates, the highest rates are among people of color. And this data may be 10 years old, but it remains true today. And when we look at each state's incarceration rate by race and ethnicity, there are several states where native men, women, and children are incarcerated at higher rates than any other ethnicity, like in Montana. Native people make up 6% of the general population, but compose 22% of the prison and jail population. On a reservation, we have a few layers of law enforcement. We have the local police, the county police, the state police, the tribal police, and the FBI. Today, we live amid a pandemic, and this is Abigail Echohawk, Chief Research Officer of the Seattle Indian Health Board. And during the start of the pandemic, when no PPE could be found, she requested personal protective equipment from local, state, and federal entities. And her clinic was sent one box, which contained cadaver body bags. Abigail made a traditional dress out of the cadaver bags and toe tags. Additionally, Abigail and her colleagues recently published a report card grading each state according to their ability to document and track American Indian Alaska Native data related to COVID. So remember, identity is a large issue for Native people and has legal implications. Misclassification of Native people leads to chronic undercounting, erasing our presence, and limiting our resources. During COVID, a prominent hospital in the Southwest, women were racially profiled and then their addresses were checked to see if they lived on or near a reservation. No matter if that tribe had not had one case of COVID, the child, the newborn, was separated from its mother by hospital policies that still have not been clearly shared today. Another issue is IHS. We know IHS is chronically underfunded and demonstrated by the infrastructure needs and the hospital closures we have and its inability to meet 100% of our people's needs. About five months into the pandemic, a prominent IHS hospital shut down suddenly without any forewarning or explanation, stunning the local community and lawmakers, but placing a heavy burden for more than 200 pregnant people to find another place to deliver. The disparities we see throughout IHS service sites and facilities is a reflection of the little regard the federal government has for our people is a direct reflection of how little they regard our history and the treaty rights we have. So what do we know? This is gonna be a quick glaze over what is known about Indian, American Indian and Alaska Native health, because we don't know much. We know that indigenous women living on or near reservations are often rural and experience additional burdens when accessing healthcare. For example, in Montana, Native women traveled significantly farther than white women to deliver their baby, and Native women are 20 times more likely to give birth at a lower level tiered hospital that may not have the resources to handle the complicated pregnant person, labor, or birth. 
We know that Native women are at risk for preterm birth, and there's a laundry list of factors of affecting their risk, but consider the compounding multi-layered risks um, adding to their stress and complications, geography, resources, population differences. Additionally, a recent review found that when identifying maternal mortality, the top three reasons why pregnant and postpartum Native American women die include hemorrhage, cardiomyopathies, and hypertension, hypertensive disorders. However, as was mentioned briefly yesterday, um, injury or homicide is a leading cause of maternal death in our country with prior research pointing to black and indigenous women facing higher rates of homicide and injury than white women. All four women, my brother, my grandmother, my great aunt, my mother and my friend Tashina were already rooted in their history, living on their reservation. A history steeped in violence, loss, grief, abuse, and fear. And aside from the sheer number of indigenous people lost in contact due to diseases and knowledge lost from those deaths, we need to consider targeted government policies that forcefully remove natives from their ancestral land, imprison them on reservations, force them into boarding schools to assimilate, and sterilization campaigns waged against this population. Given these events and ongoing daily toxic stress in the form of high incarceration rates, living amidst racism on and off reservations, living with knowledge that women, girls, and children may go missing or murdered any moment, food and insecurity and food and housing insecurity also specifically being targeted um, by our race and ethnicity, we can see how self-medication for these life circumstances may be used and risk for preterm births, hypertension, preeclampsia, infant deaths, and injuries may occur within this population at higher rates. Some key issues from today's presentation. First, maternal infant outcomes we see today are a result of historical and contemporary policies and the setting of continued structural racism many Native people face. Second, these health outcomes among Native women should be contextualized in the family and community. Data and interventions are framed within a Western worldview often. And as was mentioned by yesterday's panel, there is a need and a call to expand these spaces to include indigenous worldviews, ways of knowing and ways of doing. More simply, to affect change for the birthing person and infant, we need to address the fathers, the partners, the family and the community at large with the community's involvement and leadership. Third, we need measures to increase the workforce diversity and provide options for patients to seek indigenous midwives, doulas, physicians, nurses, et cetera, proper funding and recruitment to help create this pipeline, but also maintain it and make sure native health care professionals successfully complete their studies. I am a product of one early pipeline called the InMed program. I was one of 100 native American students that went to the University of North Dakota during middle school and high school age. And it was precisely because of that experience that I got into healthcare. Fourth is perhaps the most sensitive issue. We lack simple maternal infant health data, in particular from IHS. We do not know simple numbers like birth rate, maternal mortality rate, sewage rate. Without data, we do not know if regional differences exist. If we have regional differences in the rate of rurality and degree of poverty, then I would assume, following our theories mentioned above and supported by the CDC and HRSA, there is possibility that some Native communities have worse maternal infant outcomes than others. Additionally, we don't know the effect IHS hospital closures for pregnant people, as happened in 2020 with the Phoenix Area Indian um, Health Service suite closing, nor do we know the rate of transfers out of an IHS facility to other hospitals for delivery. That may place additional burdens on family. We're learning more about burden placed upon rural communities as time goes on. And finally, 530 years have passed since contact when Columbus lost his way and Native people found him. It has taken 530 years to get us here today. And what will it take to bring us back to balance? Remember how I shared that something was missing, something that would explain the negative outcomes. I hope this presentation demonstrates how history is key to understanding maternal infant health outcomes 